Well, I mean, you've told this story uh, and you, uh, many times, but you became uh, president of the railroad in 1989. Right. And almost immediately that same year, you entered into this agreement with J.B. Hunt? Was it... Uh, uh, yeah, that's correct. And, so uh, in addition to sort of tackling this uh, labor issue, which was really on your mind, this sort of revolutionary uh, or historic moment also was, was about to take place. Can you... Yeah, it was. Uh, there were a lot of things going on, not just the labor relations changing, you know, the work rules and crew sizes and so on. But again, we uh, sold off or leased uh, 20% of our railroad uh, to short lines, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. but we kept 93% of the uh, revenues. And then we also uh, focused on uh, the return on uh, business, because instead of thinking about volume, we were looking at profitability. And who was the uh, fellow that I assigned when I became president to do that, Carl Ice, who is now the uh, CEO of the BNSF. Uh -huh. He was the guy that mm -hmm. started uh, measuring uh, profitability of all of our traffic, and and we demarketed a lot of traffic. So, what you does know, that we, mean? what we, is demarketed? What do you mean? Just, uh, to, just well, like, out of that market, uh, like, yeah, yeah, like intermodal business between Denver and Dallas and Houston. Uh, the BN had a much more straight route, and we had a circuitous route. Mm -hmm. We'd have to come clear back through Kansas and then go south. I see. And we were losing money on every load. And then also we were shipping intermodal from Denver to Los Angeles. Well, the UP had a straight shot out there, and uh, Southern Pacific as well. So it just didn't make So we we just demarketed or got rid of that kind of business. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, at that time a lot of the wall streeters were coming back and said man your loadings are going down and i said don't look at the loadings look at the profitability yeah. mm -hmm. and then and that that subsequently led you into this uh partnership partnership with uh because i was reading the difference between the truck truck or trucking companies being a customer or you being a customer but yeah. you were really in it together yeah well it uh Actually, you know, I mentioned earlier that McKinsey had come on the property right. in 1988, and I had been trying to tell them that w we should team up with a trucking company. Uh, when you looked at all the transportation competition in the United States, we didn't need to go out and buy a trucking company. We had already owned one at one time that failed because railroaders don't know how to run trucking companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't need to have a subsidiary. If what we should do is team up with a trucking company. So actually, McKinsey uh, went to the marketing people at that time when they were on the property in 88, and they said, hey, you know, Haverty said we ought to think about teaming up with a trucking company. And they said, you know, the reason he's in operations is because he doesn't understand anything about marketing. And trucking companies and railroads will never be able to work together. Well, uh, then a few months later, I was named uh, president. And, and I've told this story before, but actually, when I got my MBA at the University of Chicago, I had clear back in 1982, I had written a thesis for my marketing course saying that a trucking company and a railroad should team up because mm -hmm. railroads are great over the long haul. But, but trucking companies can go to much shorter distances uh, much more efficiently than railroads. So to me, it was common sense, logic. Mm -hmm. But nobody really wanted to do that. So after I became president, I took this fellow that was leading the study for McKenzie. His name was John Russell. And then I also took the uh, professor uh, that I had from the University of Chicago that was in the marketing department when I had written that thesis. And they say that the old saying is that a picture's worth a thousand words. So we put business cars on the rear of an intermodal train and we took off. And I kept trying to tell McKenzie, you know, that you just don't understand the, truck, the trucking business out there is just eating us up. So anyway, we get out going through New Mexico on Interstate 40, which was literally 30 yards away from us. We're running 
70 miles an hour. And uh, we had a three-man crew at that time. And uh, these trucks out there were just almost bumper to bumper. And that was when they had the 55 mile an hour speed limit, mm -hmm. although they were mm -hmm. running faster than that. Yeah. But anyway, I said, it, and their jaws just dropped. They could not believe how much traffic was out there. And this is literally what happened. I said, I, I didn't know J.B. Hunt from Adam, but a great majority of the trucks that were out there on Interstate 40 were J.B. Hunt trailers and trucks. I said, I bet you if I could meet J.B. Hunt that I could convince him that his trailers would be better off over on the steel highway than over on that concrete highway. So anyway, John Russell said, you know, we've done some business for J.B. Hunt Transport. Let me see if we can set up a meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, two weeks later, uh, we flew down. I took uh, Don McInnes, who was the head of our intermodal uh, department at uh, that time. Mayor Brees was our vice president. Operations, uh, Owen Zadar was in the intermodal. We took him down. And John Russell. And we then decided that we were going to try and tell them the story of why they should do business with us. Mm -hmm. Sure. And this, this is in, what, the fall of 89? or the uh, this, this was in... Uh, I took them out in October uh, of uh, 1989. Okay. And uh, then two weeks later, it was right around the first part of October. And so then uh, two weeks later, they set up a meeting. And uh, we were not supposed to actually meet with JB. Uh, we were going to meet with Kirk Thompson, who was the president of JB Hunt Transport, and Paul Burgeon who was the head of their marketing department, also their legal department. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we went down there and we went to Lowell, Arkansas and walked into his office. That's where it used to be. It's in Rogers now. But mm -hmm. um, And here's this guy standing there in his cowboy hat, uh, cowboy boots, and he says, hey, I'm J.B. Hunt. And I said, I'm Mike Haverty. And <laughs> anyway, we went into the meeting and... Uh, we really hit it off. And every railroad in the United States had been to see him and wanted uh, J.B. Hunt Transport to be a customer. And he said, I don't want to be a customer. He said, if we're going to do something, it's got to be a partnership. And I said, you know what? I think we can do that. So uh, he was going to come up to uh, American Trucking Association ATA meeting two weeks later. And he was staying uh, at the uh, Conrad Hilton right down the street from Santa Fe headquarters. And so I invited him up uh, to take a train trip. And I went out to Corwith Yard and made sure hmm. everybody cleaned everything up because uh, hmm. he liked uh, everything nice and clean. And his drivers wore uniforms like UPS. and. Mm -hmm and so on, and they washed the trucks, and so anyway, we had everything gleaming, and we had the war bonnet uh, locomotives on the, this uh, intermodal train we were getting ready to to take off on, and at the rear we had some uh, cars on the rear, and uh, then we put one of his trailers right in front of a business car so we could stand out on the deck there and watch that, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that trailer had road, and so anyway, we take off out of Corwith and Interstate uh, 55 is totally backed up, bumper to bumper, and uh -huh. we're going 70 miles an hour and so on. Mm -hmm. And you know, this that, this story has been told many, many times. Uh -huh. He is the one. It was we were sitting across from each other, and he's the one that got up and walked over to me and said, Haverty, we got a deal. And I said, J.B., what's the deal? He said, I don't know. But he, <laughs> but he said, we're going to do a deal. And based on that handshake, mm -hmm. we did not have a formal agreement. And I assigned uh, Carl Ice to help negotiate the agreement, and then also a, a lawyer named Rick Weicker, who I thought a tremendous amount of still do. And uh, 
and they negotiated the agreement and and we did we we shared the revenues mm -hmm. and so on mm -hmm. and it uh, turned out to be a tremendous uh thing for us i think you know by the time uh we got the final agreement done i think we were doing 30 million dollars uh, business and and i i just went uh, the other day, uh, the other night, to uh, Matt Rose's retirement party, and I saw the fellow that now is uh, dealing with J.B. Hunt, and he told me in 2018 they handled 1.5 million uh, J.B. Hunt units on BNSF. So that wow. handshake went wow. to 1.5 wow. million, and the revenues are about 1.5 billion. So, and and that was the first time in the industry that that happened. Yes. Wow. And, and you know, as uh, many things that I've done my career, like investing in Mexico and mm -hmm. so on and mm -hmm. different things, people said, you know, he's crazy, doesn't know what he's doing, it's never going to work. Trucking companies hate each other and so on. But, yeah. you know, take a look at these uh, trains now. And, yeah. uh, Werner well, I know, I... and Schneider, and they, they're all on board. I had the privilege of meeting... Um, Mr. Uh, I think it's I think McKinney Maersk, Maersk Moller from Denmark. Oh yeah, yeah. And he uh, was a big uh, contributor to the Smithsonian. And I asked him um, why he gave uh, several million dollars to the Smithsonian to for our maritime history hall. And he said, well, during World War II, I was ex exiled from my country, and I ran my co my company out of New York and I wanted to give something to to America but Maersk uh, has quite a an intermodal operation they were uh, our biggest uh, ocean carrier uh, business at Santa Fe and uh, uh, our biggest customer was UPS mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we ran trains that were almost is exclusively UPS traffic, and then we ran trains that were containers, double stack Maersk containers, and we had a tremendous relationship with Maersk. They were our biggest uh, customer. Did you ever meet him? Uh, you know, I actually uh, I did meet him, and you know the ironic thing is that his wife is from here in Missouri. I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, it, it, out on, uh, uh, you know, I can't think of the town right now, but uh, on our line mm -hmm. that runs between here and East St. Louis, she was, uh, she was born out there. Huh. And in fact, we wanted to uh, put a put a monument up there because, uh, and uh, I'd actually gone to to uh, Copenhagen, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. but. Uh, he did. He didn't. He he was a guy very low key. Yeah. He he gave us several million dollars, yeah. and he didn't want his name on the yeah, gallery. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, the kind of person he was. And his staff told us, and you'll appreciate this, they didn't even know. He just went to the post office himself and mailed the check, uh, and hadn't even told his staff that he was doing it. That uh, would be that would be typical. Yeah, That's why he ran his company. Quite an honor to meet him. I just thought you'd, you'd enjoy that. So I mean that 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 um, that really revel that this handshake, which occurred, and were you were you stopped at Galesburg? You were just no, passing through. No, and kind of... and the date was uh, November first, nineteen eighty nine. Okay, and, and the train, it just was by total chance that it was going through Galesburg, and we were running from Chicago to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that's a high speed line there. Yes. And uh, he was uh, extremely impressed. And yeah. as you yeah. saw on the video, that we yes. talked about that. And, yes. And uh, well, I'm not going to ask you to go back through that yeah. again, but I think the, that these are great stories. And, and again, in talking about turning points in the industry, this has got to be one of the one of the big ones. The Staggers Act you mentioned earlier, which was eight nine years before. But it still took that much time before the impact really was was beginning to be felt, and and uh, the yeah. deregulation, the the ability to work out. Could you have worked out a a deal like that under the old uh, no. old rules? Would have never happened. Right. 
And uh, I will also tell you that uh, under the old regulated environment, uh, I would have never been president of uh, Santa Fe. Uh, again, it was everything yeah. was mm -hmm. a lot of politics and you know and all that and sure. and I was not been cut out of that mold and. So anyway, I would have never made it. I spoke out and said what I thought needed to be done, and we did it, and that was it. So you, um, we stayed with the with the Santa Fe for another six years. You were only there for no. Uh, oh. I, I was there for uh, two years as president. As president. Yeah. In fact, uh, when I was named president, I was uh, forty-four. I was actually the youngest president in a hundred years since William Barstow Strong. Uh -huh. And, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, what was happening is we were selling off all of the assets or spinning off all of the assets of Santa Fe I Industries see. and going mm -hmm. back to being a, a pure railroad. And Rob Krebs was the chairman and CEO. And I was the, uh, uh, and, and it was, he's only a little, year and a half older than I am. Uh -huh. And uh, so it finally had been, uh, by 1992, uh, I could see that he wanted to run the railroad, and I decided that you really didn't need two uh, people to run the same railroad, so I decided to move on. I knew you respected him, though. You thought, yes, you know. and it, it was uh, because of him that I became president. If it not, had not been for him, uh -huh. and I you know, told the Lexton group that, and I said that before publicly, uh, it, it was because of him that I was became president. I mean, McKinsey recommended me, but he was the, the person that was making the decision. Uh -huh. But two years is a relatively short tenure, and then you you stepped aside and, yeah, and but we, uh, started we, your own. We turned that company upside down yeah, two, years, in two years. I, I, the, I the used to have customers and, yeah. come and say, well, what are you going to do next? I mean, yeah. But the, we didn't have all, we didn't have all the service failures that you see with a lot of changes now. Mm -hmm. Did it take a, a personal uh, effort? Take that lot out of you with, uh, with that many changes in two years? And... Extremely stressful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was uh, very stressful, and and you will recall, and you know that I actually had a couple of heart surgeries, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah. anyway, so when I took off. Uh, uh, and I left. I actually I took a year off mm -hmm. and just spent time with my family that I hadn't had an opportunity to do, and went to see my son play baseball. We took a family vacation mm -hmm. to Hawaii, and then then I formed my own company and uh, Haverty Corp uh, that looked at transportation investments, and uh, so. Uh, but anyway, I, I took some time off. I I was definitely. Uh, worn out.